thank everybody for being here today for this uh, periodic seminar. Today we have a talk by Shashank. Shashank is a PhD student here at the lab. He's doing his PhD with uh, Eduardo. And uh, today he, he will be talking about the programming for wireless sensor networks. This is a joint work that he did with uh, uh, Professor Luca Motola when during his visit in, uh, at the Politecnico di Milan. So, Shishan, you have around 30 minutes for the talk. And, uh, so, for uh, example, this is a work which I, I did during a short visit in Milan. So, it's, it's a very short work, so it won't take 30 minutes, hopefully. And I know a lot of you are already pretty busy with some deadlines. Uh, things, one, two, three, so almost like less than 25% people here are from Sensor Network. So I'm gonna, I prepared this slide in a way to give a bit of background on programming. So that's why the title is programming. And towards the end of 40% uh, of the presentation, I put in the work, specific work. So I guess that's very basic things. This is the slides I've been using since I've been giving talks here for wireless sensor network. What are the, the basic uh, criteria to define sensor networks? So in terms of application, Sensor Networks has two types of domain. One is towards the personal user based uh, to enhance user requirements. So like uh, smart homes or healthcare. And then there are more uh, broader industrial type of applications. In terms of activity, it's basically uh, a Sensor Network is about sensing, collecting the data and acting on the base of the data. Uh, they, these things can be either periodically or it can be an event triggered mechanism. And uh, so, so there's a there's a huge difference between the capabilities of sensor networks, which is defined in terms of either having a, a high high level nodes, which have a high power nodes, which have uh, better processing and doing a lot of work, or having a single specific task based nodes. So, so for example, one example which we take is uh, forest fire detection. So in, in, in a forest, we, we plant nodes, sensor nodes everywhere, let's say on trees or around, around the forest. And whenever there's a fire, uh, we want to track the fire so that we can help the, uh, the fire department to, to control that. This is an example of single physical quantity with limited processing. These nodes are very small. Uh, there's only a specific task of con of measuring and, and mapping the fire. Uh, Sensor networks has been evolving towards IoT, which is a, another term, uh, which could be a combination of uh, many physical quantity and better processing with uh, applications like personal healthcare, smart city, and stuff like that. But this talk will be kind of more towards the basic sensor network, programming, how does user program, those kind of applications like this. Uh, Another application, uh, just just to give a other side. So this is the side of the industrial forest fire stuff. In the personal home scenarios, you have nodes around the home, assume, and again, when there is whenever there is an emergency, you want to track uh, where people are around this this space. You wanna you wanna put the fire alarm. You wanna tell tell the fire service whenever they arrive where the people are located. So so there are always aspects of both sides. And, and the, the question it brings is that since we are tracking a single quantity in, a, in terms of a very basic uh, sensor network, how does a user, uh, we, we enable the users to program better and better over the time. And this has been at the, the core of the, one of the, the problems, this is problems in sensor community, sensor network community. So, so just a brief description of, uh, of the hardware, how does the sensor, what is the basic structure? So obviously they have a sensors or actuators. The processing units are always, even if it's, it's, it's an IoT scenario or, or a better processing scenario, they are always in low power, that is the main advantage. Uh, you have some, uh, some communication infrastructure <coughs> and, and obviously some memory. So something like that, that's how uh, you, you, would, you would see a sensor node. One of the key thing is that over, over the last, let's say, couple of five to ten years, the nodes has been has been developing and evolving with the, with the processing unit, and because of that, today you have hundreds of nodes providing the same infrastructure in, in, on a different range. So, and which which satisfy any application. 
So going back to the, fi the, the forest fire application, you can find hundreds of nodes for the same application which will satisfy your needs. So the question comes in, if you have a standard template of, this, this, is, this is what I call a standard template of a hardware node, and the user is programming, and maybe the user doesn't know when he's programming the softwares, which nodes will be in the end using the, that, that uh, particular code. So, so there's, there's this, this question, which we call uh, the, the template of the hardware nodes. Uh, how can you program just keeping in mind the basic necessities of this template or, or the nodes which will be used, uh, which will be using your, your code? So to, to take a look at that, to do that, uh, there's a basic infrastructure of towards it was any, any embedded system. This does not just apply to Tanzania, but basically we use it in an embedded system as well. You have your application, there is some OS which is providing the resource management, the Mac, and the routing for your application. Then <coughs> there's a network which communicates through other nodes as well, and, and processor which, which controls the energy and, and the sensor. So, <coughs> so the OS will provide all the basic support for your compiling, your resource management, your uh, map and routing. The in terms of programming languages, uh, Sensor Networks has used for a long time uh, C, C as, a, as, the, as the, the standard language, as the low level language. There is also an evolved NestC, if you have heard about it. And then that's just an evolved version of uh, C, uh, which has some definitions for Sensor Networks. There are some additional services which are provided inside the OS, like in terms of localization, just for sensor network, or uh, synchronization of the clo clocks over, or the, or the network, or deploying the code using different techniques. But, but today our emphasis is the support for programming languages in the software. So just to revise what I said, there's a template for sensor nodes. This template is standard. On, on this basis of template, there are hundreds of nodes available from hundreds of manufacturers, when, and there's a template for software. The software support is pretty standard in terms of uh, last five, let's say five years stretch or 10 years stretch. Uh, C language is used as a standard low level programming. So the questions come, uh, <coughs> so the, yeah. So C language is used, and the question comes, how does, we, we wanna look at how does the user write the code independent of knowing which nodes, which hardware will be using that code. So, so as we all know, in any uh, embedded system, you, you, when you write a source code, uh, you compile it in terms of a machine code, which is obviously transferred. Now, this is, a, this is, this is an overview which can apply to, to, as I said, a lot of nodes which use the same template. And, and programming, uh, traditional programming, comes with in, 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 in this vague structure which applies to like all these templates, comes with a lot of other tasks which you have to do in addition to what you really want to do. So you wanna do, so, so in terms of structure, you, you have to handle a lot of events, you, have, you, you wanna handle your sensors, but you have to handle a lot of additional structures which are uh, taking, uh, events taking place in your, uh, in your system. So, so some standards which I think you all know are like message passing, handshaking, taking care of radio cycles, taking care of interrupts and timers. And, and most of the, the programming, traditional programming or sensor network is event driven. Like if this happens, please do that. If this happens, please do that. Uh, because it's event driven, it also exposes a lot of hardware controls to, to, to the programmer. So, so programmer has to know to know what events are happening. Programmer has to uh, control the, those those hardware which are giving the output uh, in the program. So it has to anticipate which which part of the hardware will do what, and then what I should what actions I should take. And it's a very node centric approach. This is an important part because as as going back to the these two examples, uh, the node centric approach. It's, it's good if, if you are applying for a distributed system where, where there's a single physical quantity with a limited processing. But if they are interacting uh, with, the, with the multiple quantities or multiple physical quantities which they are sensing, then you need to take care of the system behavior as well. Uh, because it might, it, it might evolve over the time. We'll, we'll go to that in a few seconds. 
So coming back here, traditional programming, again revising. There are a few additional uh, responsibilities which comes for programmer when, when they are programming for this particular template, which are such as message passing, hand handshaking, radio cycles. These are the common things which in any embedded system which happen. Most of the central network programming is done event driven and it exposes, because it's event driven, you need to take care of all the hardware control which might drive those events. And most of the approaches which are currently existing, which are popular, when I say currently existing, I mean which are standard and popular. Obviously, there are, there are advanced research which, which provide solutions to that, those, but the, 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 the uses, the programmers which are widely using, these are node-centric approaches. So this is just the, the responsibility of the programmer, there's a, there's a list of it, these. And, and mostly sensor network community considers this is a lot how uh, devices are evolving, how software are evolving, how the capabilities are evolving, even in terms of the template. Today on, 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 a, on a 50 to 250 KB, you can put a really sophisticated code and you should be able to run on, on, on a basic 8-bit micro microcontroller there. But if you give so many responsibilities to the programmer, he's going to get lazy. He's, gonna, he's not going to go into more sophisticated code, trying to optimize, he's just going to go to the task. So, what exists in terms of these, these simple uh, template-based programming is like automatic lights on and off. When you walk into the room, there's a sensor who, who detects the, the room activity and, and this kind of chart of these, these code. So this is the template, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going into low-level exact coding. I'm keeping everything on a template level so that it's more human readable and stuff. So this is a template of just a simple task of let's say auto lights on and off when you walk into a room. Uh, this is based on any OS. There are two popular OS, Tiny OS and Contiki OS, which are provided for uh, sensor networks. Both of these work on proto thread. Both of them have threads to maintain every activity, whatever uh, event you want to handle. So, so what I want to show here is two things. Uh, you have to create your own thread. So programmer has to create your own thread for every event. And in each thread, as I said, there is, if something happens, do this. So if you, as you see, there are two basically wait loops which, which are taking care of these events. Imagine this is just for one, acti one of any activity you want to do, that you want to program. Now, just evolving, as I was talking about, evolving those uh, single specific task, uh, sensor networks to where they are handling multiple uh, physical uh, uh, physical sensing capabilities. This evolves into a bit more complex. And the same for code will require multiple steps of these same threads, which basically is, let's say, again, for a, for a programmer who's, who's programming on the basis of a template, it's, it's, a, it's a burden. That's, that's a lot to ask. So what's the solution? So the sensor network community for the last few years has been providing a solution called network programming. This is again very basic knowledge. It's common. It's already solutions are in terms of network programming are available. These are high level abstractions instead of low level languages which provide a flexibility for the, for the programmer to, to get away from, <coughs> um, get away from uh, the responsibilities. There are reusable components, basically in macro programming. They are over the air programming. Basically, you can program at any time. Uh, there are some examples. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail again, but these are the standards which are used from in terms of research a lot. But these are not very standard in terms of deployed sensor networks. So, what does macro programming do? So, as we were talking about the structure, basically macro programming acts as a let's say middle pair between application and all the other things, and it gives the user a bit of flexibility to write stuff instead of taking care of all these uh, responsibilities, and it takes care of uh, other things by itself. Uh, what are the benefits? It's, it's, it provides scalability, it, it provides a kind of a separation, it provides adaptability, and the validation of behavior. So this is, all this is the basic knowledge just to give you what, what's, what's my work. Uh, when I started working, I emphasized on the adaptability. So, so there's, as I said, there are a lot of work available 
for for macro programming, but for adaptation of uh, adaptation, you you need to take care of a lot of requirements. What what would happen in future? When you talk about adaptation, uh, you need to anticipate what I am adapting to. Uh, these things can be network and load dynamics. These can be requirement change. Requirement changes means what user wants from the system, or or what what system itself. What are the necessary requirement of system itself in terms of inputs? Uh, also, performance scaling. You you might be handling a, a, a task with three nodes, and then the fourth node enter, which can which can share your performance and increase. So so these are basic definitions of what kind of adaptation in central networks can happen. In terms of network and load dynamics, uh, network performance in central networks are basically again going back to the template of the hardware there is basically always some standard communication for example uh, ag 2.15.4 which is used a lot in sensor networks for communication uh, which which is not the most uh, strongest hold of, of communication in terms of devices if they are evolving if they are processing a lot because they uh, they have a lot of message passing handshaking and the cycles and there's a lot of uh, again responsibilities for programmer to take care of it and and when when the, the the network evolves, that that those adaptation has to be handled by a main programmer, and which is not not easy. So what we want is we want to basically the goal is the ability to modify uh, the whole system behavior in terms of uh, sensor networks, and we want the user to program in such a way that they don't have to take care of all the things which I mentioned just now. <coughs> we also want that system level so system level services are something like whatever output user was requiring they that can be reprogrammed without the again the node centric approach without telling each node what to do is it possible to to adapt uh, the whole system level behavior so i mean going back to the the example of the the forest uh, in in a, in a, in a this is a plain example. You have a forest with multiple animals which we are tracking with, let's say, body. Uh, we, we have put sensor on each, each, each node, uh, on, on each animal. There are animals which are walking a lot during, during the day. There are animals who are just standing and eating grass. But then there are animals who will be sitting down, but at some point they will run a lot. So, so these are uh, behavioral changes. <laughs> Uh, which 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 can be called into requirement changes, and that's what I emphasized on. That's what the work, this work is emphasized on. That uh, if the behavioral changes of of the of the of system is 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 to be adapted, how would a programmer uh, say that how to do that to the, to the, all the system level behavior instead of writing the node centric approach? Why behavioral? Because the, the easy answer is that it, that is easy to anticipate. I can tell in my system what are the behaviors the system would have. I can tell if I have in my system a lion, a giraffe, and a pig. I can tell what would they do, and that's an. Obviously, there are other changes which I would like to target, but for this the scope of this presentation, uh, we did the behavioral changes. So again. This is just a, again just to give you a, an example of what adaptations are happening in a system. So, a lot of animals are walking around. You are tracking their health, for example. You are tracking their movement and you are recording them. And let's say a fire happens in the forest, and you want to save all the animals, all the animals. But you need to make sure that you are getting the latest data of their location if you really want to save that. And to do that. You need to adapt your wireless sensor network to, to collect that data, do whatever activity they are doing. If they have been sitting down, if they have been running around, or whatever. So, uh, <coughs> so at this point, if anybody wants to ask anything, because I hope I'm not running fast. Okay, so. Uh, the one of the, the the major things in 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 any like for example like in a forest when when I'm suppose I'm a programmer given responsibility to build this system which I just mentioned one of the things is there will be new animals coming in so I want to write my code in such way that it can scale to any new node or new animal who comes in the system so. 
So scaling to more nodes is, is the basic thing which every programmer wants. What, so this is, this is what we want. We should be willing to provide the programmers, hey, if you're writing the code for this system, it will be scalable. It will be easily, it won't be a problem if a new node comes in, even like the hybrid engine. The other thing is your system should, your nodes and systems should survive minimum thresholds, whatever minimum thresholds are. Uh, in, in, in this case, these are that I should have a latest, uh, the most latest uh, GPS location of every animal uh, whenever I want. So that's a minimum threshold. And the other one is it should respond to the input changes. In this case, input change is the fire. So the, the, the activity was to track the, uh, track the animals, but when fire happened, there was a new input to the census. But hey, there is a fire. So you need to respond. <coughs> so to do that, programmer needs to write functions which react to these data behaviors. And this has to happen online. This cannot happen over the air, which I mentioned earlier. It cannot happen that the fire happens and the system detects and it's asking for the code, like, hey, I need a new code to run to, to do the changes or whatever. That's, that's not acceptable. Why? Uh, it's, it's, it, 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 it can happen, but it's not the efficient. It will delay the, you will not have the most latest information or you will not have the most efficient way of deploying the, for example, <coughs> to answer it in, in, in case of this, suppose your, uh, your change is uh, moving the animals in such a way that when the fire, uh, fire brigade arrives, they can pick up the animals into some van. And if, the change in the, in the, the adaptation happens after the brigade arrives, then they're getting a late information. So it might delay into the actions. So it has to happen online. It has to happen on the system that uh, adaptation is happening. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, like, like uh, imagine that now you take humans instead of sensors. Okay? Yeah. I, I work uh, in, in the forest and then I can have some basic security safety measures. For example, if I see a fire, all I have to do is uh, blow the whistle and try to evacuate the animals. But then immediately I call you, my boss, and I say, okay, what exactly do I have to do? So I can implement some very basic measures in my sensors with very few codes. Yeah. But then, yes, I apply those, those those measures, and I immediately call the center to receive more optimized code. Okay, but that's yeah. how human works, yeah. right? Is yeah, I agree with that. So you what react, you said, and then you call to know yeah. exactly what you have. Yeah, to do. Uh, and that's 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 actually very good. But what you said is important. You said I can call for more optimized information. Yeah, you have some as a human. You have a brain. You have some pre-processed information, and you're acting on the base of that. And we have, as I said, we have a template nodes, template for these sensor nodes, which have capabilities. So we should be providing, ideally, the user with the capability that it might not be the most optimized, but at least there is something to do while it's asking yes. for more. Are you getting my point? But right now, with these responsibilities, when programmer writes the code, when he's taking care of these, it's already difficult to write just tracking the, the animal then adding another part like loops loops like this just for every every adaptation makes it very difficult so it, it doesn't uses the, the 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 resources template we have very efficiently am i clear like your point is right you can always get more optimized information over the air more information hey what's happening you can you can if it's a big forest you can communicate over other nodes and get like hey, where is the fire going? That, those adaptations can happen. But the basic adaptation, which I'll come to a very basic one, I'll give an example, uh, has those things, you can already, you have already have the hardware capabilities, you already have, uh, you know what, what would happen. In, that's why we are going for behavioral, because you know what, how animals will behave, basically. And so you can write those things in terms of basic optimization. Obviously, if it's a big fire, I can, uh, reach out to other nodes and optimize more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So that, that so the purpose here is basically that uh, programming has been always a rigid process. It's it's not so flexible, and macro programming for five five ten years has been trying to do that. 
And I, I'm trying to bring in adaptability into that, like adaptation. And, and we'll talk about what kind of exact ad adaptation I'm talking about in terms of behavior. Okay. So, 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 uh, yeah. So, what was the Why is the desired of express desired outcome a simple way of adaptation? So, you, that's, that's a question that would you want, I, I, I should say programmer here, first of all, not user. Uh, can programmer express that, uh, <coughs> get me the latest data, instead of, like, like how do you express your adaptation policy? Would you write every, every if and else, like, which is very obvious? So instead of writing, you know, so nested loops in terms of, or simple way you just say, so that's the part of abstraction, the macro programming, that you give a, a middleware to the programmer that, hey, I just want this if fire happens. I don't want to say that if there's a temperature rising in this area, then do this, and then I want to collect the location of every location. So. So that's that's what I, that's the templates for exit policies, like these kind of uh, standard policies which you would want in a in a scenario. Can you come up with that? And that that's one of the questions. So these are basically the questions I'm trying to target currently through through this work. And uh, expressing in simple way helps in, in evolving what you can do more and more. What is simple programming? Uh, effort in writing a piece of code which does something and what is the adaptation policy for example I can I can understand why you say changes to something is an adaptation yeah. so what is expressing a desired outcome in a simple way in adaptation okay uh, I, I'll answer the adaptation policy in a slide no no so, so in simple way it's like again going back to the this is not the simplest way of writing the code already. You have to start timers, you have to start threads. So when I say simple way here, is simple programming way. Can you... Can libraries to do all of that, right? Sorry? Libraries to do all of that. Yeah, you exactly. Start something yeah, it's, it's not something novel in terms of abstraction. There are libraries already providing a lot of simple ways of writing stuff, you know, and functions. But in terms of adaptation, it's it's an addition to the, to the middle, the macro programming. Uh, work for the sensor networks. Uh, so, so, so the simple way here is to take away all these responsibilities of threads, timers, interrupts, message passing, handshaking for everything you want to do, and just saying, "Hey, just get me the data, or get me this." So, so, so now to explain so what I, is an adaptation I policy. I don't think I understood this adaptation. Well. What do you mean when you say adapt? Okay, let me explain this slide. I think it might answer. Sure. So this is the simplest example of an adaptation policy. <coughs> you have, uh, you have, let's say, two pigs roaming around. What this is, this is an adapt. What adaptation? One of the adaptation policies you would want is for you have a sensor on each animal, and for the for counting the speed, exact current speed, and the battery levels of the node you want to pull the GPS with a rate. So you, there's a GPS sensor on the node, and you want to pull it for, for exact GPS data. But you want to pull it in such a rate that your battery levels are above a threshold because you want to get always a fresh data after time t. This time t could be either uh, end of the day. In the end of the day, you decide the program says, I want at least this battery level to be survivable. Or it could be a predefined location until the animal arrives this location, which can be a, a reporting location, a base station, uh, a next base station, or something like that. I want, so basically this is an adaptation policy, which in, in, in simple terms, the policy is here to pull the GPS with rate R, counting the speed as of the, of the animal itself and the current battery levels, so that they are always above a threshold. So, so, does that answer the question of adapt? What is an adaptation policy? So, what's the purpose of this uh, policy? So, you want to like, be uh, energy efficient, or you want to be more accurate? Uh, so, you, what you want is you want to maximize the rate. You want to pull as much as you can, so that whenever something happens, you have the most latest GPS information. 
but you need to make sure that there is this constraint that we need to have the threshold uh, above threshold battery levels. I think probably you mean optimize R. Yeah, optimize. optimize. Yeah. Is the rate at the as the rates, this rate. Ah, okay, okay. At at the rate which sensor the, 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 the sensor node itself will pull. So there will be a rate at which the GPS will be pulled, right? The average, let's say, two millisecond or ten millisecond, and you can change that rate, right? You can according to whatever your battery levels are. Because, for example, in a very sim simple sensor node, the only task which is energy heavy is you are pulling the sensor. Right now, so if you want to, to to adapt to your your speed, how the the animal is walking, what the animal is doing during the day, you want to make sure that your battery levels are above threshold according to the time of the day or maybe next base station. You can change this R, but in terms of overall objective of the user, he wants the fresh data, so you have to maximize the R. You have to or optimize maybe that's the correct way. You have to make sure. That because it's an optimization problem. Yeah. It is. This is the way it is written. No, 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 but that's it not maximize the means I would say. When I say maximize, minimize. It's a semi-scaptures. Oh, yeah. yeah. In this context. I, I would say you system. would want to minimize R without losing some problem. No, I want to maximize R. That's what I'm saying. It's, I don't think it's max. It's more like optimization in the right way. Because, because, once you, because you don't want to sample as Maximize R meaning I will just say no, no, that's what in this context he wants to. You, he, I want to sample as much as one wants because I want to have the most. So basically, it has not he has an objective function and he has constraints. So there is only one. Function is maximized. Yeah. So basically, this goes like this. I, I just. Because I mean, once you maximize R, but without maximizing R, you consume more data. That's right. That's exactly what he wants. That's what he wants. He wants to, he wants to that as, uh, the freshness of the data must be the smallest possible. We saw the use in this battery. So we will maximize its uh, I think it's, that's right. Okay. It's a way of doing it. To me, it's minimize without losing the freshness. Minimize what? Minimize. It's okay. We are getting into unnecessary discussion. Okay. Anyway. You had a question? I'm afraid you which is fine. So that's that. That's why I mentioned after IMT or at predefined locations, because in these applications you have to take in mind that overall objective is the fresh data. But for example, I took one hour for the sense, sensing work. And because of you maximize the R, yeah, it gets five minutes uh, better. And then just no, that's why it's, uh, data. that's the constraint to maximize, right? So you would not. That's the constraint. You can only have more constraints to search better. The constraint is higher than the ob objective, right? But then you can get more. You cannot get fresh data. So you need to for instance, to have some uh, some constraint which is saying that the variation of R over a certain time t is uh, yeah, something like that. You could say in that way. So, so it's not assuring that you will get the most fresh data always possible. It's assuring that within the battery levels, whatever fresh data you can get will be there. Okay. So, so, so this is this is. Okay. So what what I did was kind of develop it into some blocks because. We are talking about microprogramming providing support in terms of abstraction. So, so I took the problem and we did some blocks. What are the basic blocks? Are. So there is a function, the relationship between the battery levels and the, the polling rate of the sense, the GPS sensor. The constraint is the battery level should always be above the threshold. The objective is to maximize R. And we say that we take all these variables, we put it into input into a solution, whatever, it is, uh, and, and we don't care what is the optimization solution here. The objective here is to provide programming support. So we take these variables, we put into a solution, and the adaptation happens, let's say, at a fixed rate, R A, I call, or by an interesting event. An interesting event is suppose it encounters, suppose it stops, the speed is changed drastically, or anything user defines. User can define anything. So what we do is we take these basic blocks, we put them into an adaptation 
and we expect every time whenever this adaptation happens, a new R is provided, which will now pull the, the sensors with that R, which will keep the battery level, which will keep the constraint satisfied. Is that clear? I hope I'm not confusing anyone. We don't care. It's it's a, it's an optimization solution. Anyone can come up with a solution and write. Yes, but that's your node that needs to do that, right? So Sorry? You, you need to have the computer the computing power to uh, Yeah yeah. But like my objective here is not to solve the optimization problem. My objective here is to provide the programmer a support to write this in programming when he programs in an easiest way. That's what I'm trying to achieve. There is something here I mean understood, but where is this uh, optimization or this solver uh, implemented? It will be on the node. In the in the application where you are saying I want how the many instructions you can perform per second in, uh, in your node? How many instructions? It depends on but let's say on a on a on a TLS V mode, you, you can easily go for around um, I think more than hundred easily per second. These days, that, but this changes, like if you go to Mika Z, which is, these is are more powerful, they come up with, instead of a, a microcontroller, they come with a microprocessor, and, and they are more, uh, more, much, much more compatible. Can this be offline? <laughs> oh, yeah, that question comes to Vincent's thing that it can be offline somewhere else and you can get the information there. But that's not part of your... No. My part is that the node is there, the program is there, and the user is already writing the program for polling the sensor, and he wants to make sure that always he has fresh data while... Yes. But the question is important, right? It depends on what was its cost. Uh, I wouldn't use it if it is a very costly affair, which would itself bring the battery down. Mm -hmm. Cost of what? Of running your optimization. Oh. I, I think, to me, the way I see it is we shouldn't bog down by this optimization problem. It's exactly. probably one use case that he has given. Optimization mm -hmm. problem is not the... I don't want to solve no, the optimization problem. I'm fine with that. I'm saying the cost of it. What are the cost? Yeah, there is a cost. I, I get your point. There is a cost in terms of running it. I, I come to evaluation, which is which is the same. But there is a cost higher uh, in terms of uh, running the normal C code, which and and this this way. But it's it's also a, a cost of having that update, having that section, having this, this solution. There is a cost to it. Yeah. I'm not sure how to do it. Yeah. What you are proposing, as I see it, is a domain specific language for ease for the ease of implementation of sensor networks, not for the specialized programming. No. So you rely on some components that exist. Yeah. And eventually you can even extend this with annotations or contracts which go a bit deeper in detail saying that okay. Pulling mm -hmm. from the GPS costs some amount of energy, <coughs> which will then sell to the user. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Somehow save the user. So, so these right. relationships. So it's a, a, an upper layer. Upper oh. layer. Yeah. So the, these relationships can be like this relationship between the the battery level and the, the R. I don't care what the relationship is. That would be defined by particular hardware. I'm providing an upper layer on top of it, so that the, when the programmer is writing the, the 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 code, he can write it easily, and maybe this relationship will change for every node, other node. So I'm providing an abstraction on top of that, and then these, these things can change, maybe. But, but the code will scale, code will sustain the changes. So if this one is clear, I can present another use case, maybe. So I, I thought maybe two use cases would clarify, but it seems like it's just confusing more. Guru, you wanted to ask something? One thing is like you started by saying that the node level programming, but then you want some kind of system behavior or something. Right? Yeah. I was I'm not understanding where the system aspect is. I still I, I, see it as like a node level programming still. Yeah, yeah, the node centric approach. So, so th that's because I wanted to simplify the policy itself. Because if I took a system level adaptation, then it would just make it a complex adaptation policy. But I'll come to that. Okay. Uh, so again, I, 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 I'll just repeat. The objective here is to provide a programming support for the for the programmer to to write adaptation policies, not solve themselves. 
I don't want to solve the optimization problem here. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build a skeleton of how adaptation policies look like for sensor network. I'm trying to, to come up with a generic skeleton and use that into building my abstraction, my macro programming. Okay. One of the ways I did it is taking multiple use cases in different domains in, in, in simplest adaptation policy and, and build these structures of, of the relationships, what it looks like. I, again, I don't care about what is the relationship between V equals to FR. I don't care what is the solution inside a particular uh, optimization problem. That can change. User can implement its own solution. Mm -hmm. No, uh, sorry. Then I think I interrupted Raghu when he said, what is the cost of the solution you should worry about, right? So probably if it is no. about that, then it's a valid question. I no, no. He was asking, what is the cost of using my micro programming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Cost. yeah, there is a cost. There is a cost of having a low level C code running, which, which does everything and a compile from an abstract. There is a higher cost. It might be uh, in terms of energy as well compared to that. But here I'm giving the ease of access. So it's, it's that balance. I mean, the thing is, I think what he's saying is probably there should be valuation or you know, comparison for people yeah. With the ease of access has a higher benefit than I'll, the cost. I'll, I'll come to the evaluation of it in terms of. So, so th that's another thing. In macro programming, when you are giving the abstractions for programming, the evaluation is not. Because obviously there is a cost, but what is what does matter to you? Does it matter to you the line of code you have to write? Does it matter to you uh, how much uh, memory it is taking the code when it's running and stuff like that? I'll come to that. I'll just give another use case, maybe. I hope this helps. So, so in a fridge and a refrigeration unit, uh, for a volume V and for a time period T, you want to maintain a temperature, right? And what you want is your power uses to be below a threshold so that the cost is minimized. This is a, again a simple adaptation policy just for one node which, which is inside this refrigerator, which is uh, giving the output. So we again adapted that the relationships between the temperature and the power, the relationship between the cost and the power, and the constraint and the objective, and again giving it back to the variables to that and getting the power which is required and adapting the power all the time, keeping the cost minimum. So what you have? Another question about that, which is okay, that's a very well defined uh, uh, language, okay, but. When is it activated? When is this function activated? Because the temperature in the fridge, for instance, will vary all the time. Do so you have to solve your problem all the time? No. At a rate, so the so user says, I want to make sure that my, my power which I'm giving to the refrigerator or the, the rate I'm pulling the sensor, every one hour, it's 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 the correct one. It's the most efficient one. Yes. User can say, time. or it could be an interesting event which could be like the boar died, the, the animal died, so I have to shut it down, or the boar is sleeping. Okay, so you, you say it's like, so it's still event based. It is still event, yeah, event, it's event driven. It's, uh, uh, it's on, the, on, the, uh, on the periodic as well, both periodic and event, basically. And I'm, I'm gonna provide, I'm gonna explain in, in code that how it's an abstraction on that, but the user doesn't have to, uh, so, so for any event driven thing, here user has to create a condition, what is the event, and again the thing of if this happens, do that. And I want to take away that from the user. I don't want user the responsibility of every time thinking, if this happens, I need to do that. I want user to write in such a way, I want this. Yes, you basically don't want to say how you need to adapt your solution, you just want to say what the solution should be. Yeah. If user really wants it, we provide the support of that in terms of, so that's the simplest way I thought of, a, a constant rate. Or you can flag events in your code, which is also we provide an abstraction for that, that you can flag them easily and you can say that whenever this event happens, just do my adaptation. Uh, so basically you take the power, like if this happens, that should happen. This yeah. You're taking that away from the user. Yeah. Uh, from so user when he's programming, he's not thinking of that. Right? So you make everything into a same problem, right? 
Yeah. So you may see. Okay. Yeah. So and let I'll take a small example here. Like take this uh, fire scenario. Yeah. Uh, and our aim, let it be like we are saving the animals, take them to a rescue point. Yeah. As the final definition. Yeah. So each animal runs differently. Yeah. In uh, a different speed and yeah, things yeah. like that. So unless you give a threshold for each and every sensor put on a thing, you can't achieve your. Final threshold for what? Uh, threshold for their speed, for an example. Or no, I don't care how they are running. What I care about in this example is threshold for the battery levels. Uh, I no, in this case, but I'm talking in another, another use case. Like if you have that uh, final uh, final uh, destination, what will you do? I mean, like final destination. Like that is what you want. That all animals should be saved. Actually, yeah. And but each and everything runs differently. Yeah. So I have to. I need to do that. I need the current location, the most uh, latest location. Which will be done by maximizing the R, every more and more frequently polling the sensors. Okay. Depending on obviously their speed, as you said, but also the battery level. But I that's that's the thing which is behavioral change. The speed will change. I don't know how how the animal. That's that's unknown to me, and I want the system to adapt according to that. And, and, and this is just one simple thing. Uh, as Guru was asking, that how is it the system level? On, on a huge system level, which you said, the systems, the, 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 the animals might be interacting, they might be passing each other, they might be passing a lot of base stations, and, and those kind of things can happen. So basically, we came up with this structure, and what I defined was that there are a few components which are required, which are minimum, minimum requirements for writing a program for adaptation policies, and there's a function which is relationship between the input variables. There's an adaptation which is happening either at a concentrate or by a trigger in the system behavior. There are constraints which are either operational or behavioral, and there is a solution to give the desired output. Oops, uh, I thought it would look better. Can you see that? Yeah. See me? Okay, good. So the left side is the code, again, not very low level code, but mostly representing the code which currently a programmer would drive. And the right side is basically representing my code. What I have done is converted this code in, in an abstraction using this, these, basically these components and giving it a structure and writing a backend middleware. So, so for example, if you have a, 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 an abstract block for a trigger, what would trigger the adaptation? You can write a solution inside a block called solution, and you can write your constraints in a block called constraint, and you can write your relationships of function, and you can write your adaptation. The, 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 the most important part are that these blocks are independent. So they can change, they can scale. You can add new blocks, you can change inside the blocks, but you don't have to go back and change, uh, let's say, the triggers if you're changing the relationship. Or you, you can add new triggers, you don't have to change. But in the code which I wrote here, if you want to add a new trigger, for example, here, you have to add like and my new trigger. You have to go and dig into the code. So as, as Raghu was asking, what is the cost? Why would I use this? The cost is the scalability and the ease of access, the writing. And that's what all microprogramming is about. There are a lot of capabilities the hardware already provides. Software, ease of access can enable programmers to write more and more easily and more efficiently use this. So what do I do basically to do this? Uh, there's an implementation of a middleware in Python. Uh, there's a graphical, uh, also graphical support, uh, but mostly it's non-graphical, so a lot of work is on, on, on command line this. But there's a middleware basically to convert each block which I just said, uh, for the Quantiki OS. Quantiki OS is the sensor network OS. I chose it because it's the one, one of the most popular ones. They support to scale each block, each, each block. When I say each block, I mean the type of each block, like trigger, solution, these, these components basically. Uh, I should have used this in the I'm sorry. And support to scale each block for multiple instances. So if you create one function with one relationship, you can take it and you can create multiple instances over your network system and it will work. You don't have to write, go back and write a new uh, function for for a new new program. You can just use the library's function. It's it. I have a feeling that um, the two codes may not be equivalent. 
They are not. Well, so like here you have it, an assumption on the right hand code. Yeah. And you don't have on the left hand one. Uh, on the right hand you have uh, uh, independency. Yeah. Uh, only for the constraint. Yeah. And that is going to have that on the left. Okay. I'm not sure I'm understanding. What kind of independency? So basically, on the right hand uh, code, I can easily add a constraint. Yeah. I just, have, I just yeah. write a block, blah, 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 yeah. with the, the variable to use and the, the output. And that I don't have that on the left. So I can have a code yeah. um, that I cannot convert in your system. Yes, you can. That's so so what is this? Isn't this, sorry, isn't this a compilation process? It is. That's what I. It is. It is a compilation. So that is a problem. If you have, there can be a code which will not work for my middleware. Then there can be a code which you have in this form which you cannot convert. There might be possible a scenario I might not have thought about. So this is again. The process was based on coming up with simplest adaptation policies and seeing what is the minimum requirement of writing these adaptation policies. And, and how can I provide a middleware for programmer to take away all the responsibilities which I've been talking about, like threads, timers, triggers, all this. So just to give you an example, what what David said about compilation, the basic Android system works like this: you write you write a source code, you your OS compiles it, and in the end you are you, you have to send the machine code. So even the left side code or the right side code, they both are not going in as it is formed to the to the, the node. They are being compiled. The difference is my source code is now different and is compiled through a middle. It's not going like it's not on top of this, it's a different branch which is going, which is being compiled by my own libraries, my own Python support. So yeah. Does that satisfy? So, uh, coming back to the evaluation. So, yeah, I mean, evaluation is tricky, but to say that what, why do you, why would you want to use it? So, what I did was basically in, in programming, we say what is the cost of memory, basically. Why, how would you define? So, what are kind of variables you are using? So, so in these two examples, I wrote the code, and and what I observed was that by at least fifty percent, the number of variables you were defining was reducing or number of functions you were using to trigger, to start the threads, to start the, everything, it was reducing by at least 50%. Uh, basically, actually I did five use cases. There are five implementation uh, blocks done already. Uh, to add a new block, actually, you see, to add a new block to the existing, so, so if you want to add something new, and you said what you said, a new constraint or a new function, new relationship, it's, it's a fixed structure with Minimum with maximum five lines, whereas in, in, in C or Nasty, you have to again the code I showed you have to go through that and you have to start your own. And uh, yeah, size of the compiled code approximately remains the same. I have not seen any drastic change. Uh, you have a two more at most a uh, 100 to 200 byte variation, but not more than that. So that's kind of the evolution till now I have done. Uh, on the on the off side now, I'm, I'm, since it's done in terms of implementation, I'm looking into how can I evaluate in more terms of uh, usability, like when you deploy. So I haven't, I haven't, I have used Contiki. I just said it, it's done for Contiki OS. I have still, I should be using it for deployment and seeing how it behaves over time. What is the the, the changes over time? How it adapts? And I think that's. So we still have room for one or two questions. Okay, uh, I have never tried to, to implement one of these distributed systems, and I'm going to say something which is very mean to the entire community working on that. Yeah. I never understood why it's so complicated. Like, uh, like, uh, I, I mean, the, the thing is this. Um, first of all, you, you start by presenting the average features on, on every sensor, and you have a pretty decent machine. I mean, you have 250k of, of flash, you have a CPU, okay, it's an embedded one, but it does the job. And, and this is expected to be better, okay?
okay, like technology gets cheaper, smaller, so these kind of things are better and better. Yeah. Now when I, when I see the amount of memory and CPU you have, you can easily run Python, you can even run the JavaScript engine yeah. for this thing, okay? So, okay, starting by saying, oh, it's amazingly complicated because we have to use C and we have to handle plenty of things, interruptions of the hardware and so on. Well, I think you are kind of torturing yourself. You, 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 you could definitely install some libraries, interpreters, or whatever to make your life easier. And then, what these sensors are asked to do, it's always pretty simple. Like, they, 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 they sample something, and as you said, the computation can be done locally, too. So it has to be forwarded back, let's say, to my laptop here. Which means there is no limit to what I can do. Okay, because this laptop can use the cloud, can no. do whatever. So, so it has to be done locally in a lot of cases. Like if you're leaving an animal, an node on an animal on itself, it has to be done. most of the computation has to be done. Again, you can, you can, for me, you can define two different behaviors. A single yeah. one so you can, you can establish base stations all around for, uh, the forest with the higher power tablets or computers and collect the data every time an animal passes and does the computation. So you don't even have the problem with that. <laughs> but my problem is this like, I, I, I think, you know, Presentations and things about distributed system and how complicated it is, and I never understood why. It is so, so you said something. What makes it so complicated? Yeah, you said something like you don't have to use C, you can use Python, right? Yeah. That's what exactly I'm doing. Yes, yes. So, so it's just. But I think you say that the problem today is just the absence of kind of a middleware or a very. Yes. Yeah. No, the, the problem is not the absence of middleware. The problem is absence of. Um, Supportable middleware, right? which is supported by the whole someone in the back end in the community or a, a professional organization. Uh, because this is not a new work in terms of middleware, this is a new work in terms of adaptation policies. But what I said in my program, there are tons of work I quoted which are like 10 years old work in terms of middleware. But there, you see two papers, you see an implementation done in a way, and then it's there. There is no continuous support. There are some community, some Professional organization, there's one from this institute in Swedish, Swedish uh, the SICS, they have started a spin-off company which is doing this now. They are trying to provide a graphical user interface using Python and no J JavaScript, no JS. I was thinking exactly the same, because it's a asynchronous way of programming, so why don't you adapt some Node.js thing, which is exactly. amazing. You just put a callback function to whatever listener you attach to an event. And, and people do that. The problem which I'm saying is, Nobody is providing support. So, so most of the people who come up with, with these ideas are PhD students, and once they finish their PhDs, the only thing you can find is a Bitbucket, Bitbucket wrapper, or they have a wrapper yeah. of that thing. Uh, if there's a company now, I think it's called Thunder, Thunder something, which is from the Swedish Institute, which is taking off uh, on this. But they are then they are not even they are not doing it for huge programmers. They are doing it as a commercial product. So you tell them what to do, and they do it for you. Do you, um, you have to wait for Google to care enough about this problem? Google has done this as well. So I, I don't know if you know Google has a company called Nest, which is which runs basically sense nodes. And Google has it. Google has their own open source uh, platform which runs on Python. Uh, which is the problem with that is it only adapts to their devices. Okay. So and their devices are very like a closed box with a lot of memory, a lot of stuff. They don't work for the Mikazi or Dynosby nodes, which are used by everyone. So, so most of the problem comes really from the absence and, and of the support. And support. The support which I say, which is, I want to specify what's the problem. The problem is what I said. There's a template of hardware, and a lot of producers are producing these nodes. And no one is taking all these nodes and support, putting them in their libraries. So so my code right now only works for Contiguous and Dynosby nodes. If I really wanted to make it a universal thing, I would have to take all the nodes possible, make sure it's adapted to all the nodes, then everyone will use it. There is no standard, no... There's no, the standard template which I showed you, it's just I came up with, there's, like, there's no standard template of a wireless and it's a node. Uh -huh, okay. Because anything can, can be a wireless and a node, your computer is a wireless and a node. So, uh, it's kind of related, because I, I don't really use what Vincent uh, just said, that he doesn't see where the complexity is. But I'm not sure if your solution helps with that. I'm not completely okay. sure. So for me, the difficulty with distributed system is not to, co to code and program one node. So programming the behavior of one node is something simple, and uh, I can get to the problem. I'm not an expert in that. 
what is complex is having global behavior. So you, you have all the nodes that are interconnected and, and, uh, and <coughs> in a uh, uh, consistent and intelligent manner. And that's where all the complexity is, because you have to synchronize yeah. everything and you have to take uh, a global decision, sometimes locally decisions that impact the global behavior. Yeah. And so you don't know what happens everywhere. So does, does your solution help with that? Yeah, so that's what uh, Guru also asked, and, and uh, I didn't talk about it. And I had a few slides on that because I've been talking about because this work doesn't talk about all of my cases, which is if you guys have heard me talking a lot, it's context of essential networks, and and that's what I do. I'm using these adaptation policies in bringing into this this system behavior of context awareness. I define context awareness is basically it's an adaptation as well but in terms of a bigger scope and, and more uh, in terms of resource management and scheduling. And I'm bringing, I'm solving this first on a node level and trying to bring it into that. It's a step towards solving that. But I didn't talk about that because I've already given a specific presentation on that and I didn't want to add more information. But if you want, I can but open the presentation and do that. <coughs> to, to comment on that, I mean, I, I disagree with this comment because for me, like, uh, <laughs> It's a design issue, right? You, you deploy your, your network, and of course, if you allow any node to have a behavior that really changes the game, okay, like makes a huge impact on, on without having a global picture, you just have a poor design of the system. No, so no, what, no. what you have to do is like you, you deploy a system, you collect the data. I don't think that processing the data and computing something centrally is a big issue, but that's my, my take. Wait, and then, and then, every node can have kind of a, a fail-safe mode or whatever, something that if something happens, you behave in a way that you control the thing without, without affecting the entire, the entire it scene. Is mm -hmm. It is possible. It is possible. It's a design issue, right? It's, it's so not a design issue. You have a central node that will process everything and take decision for all your, your, your system at a time. Why Which not? is not something you can do when you have a large field. In a forest, how would you do if you have multiple huge population of animals? You want to put sensor nodes in everyone, and they are encountering each other on a random behavior. Ah, come on! If you have the money to deploy such a large scale network, you can put a few things, right? Obviously, you can. But again, if you, have money, if you have money, if you have money, your goal is to spend less money. No, but Chashan, if you deploy. 100,000 nodes to control an entire forest. <laughs> Do you think it makes a difference to deploy a few uh, fixed elements to collect the data? No, it is. is. I mean, it's. I, I, yeah, I agree with you. Right now, they do that. So no, right, now, I don't think it's yeah, yeah. So right now, that's what happens. Centralized approach is, is used. Even in when, when people call, oh, I'm deploying a distributed system, they are usually uh, base stations around oh, that distributed system. Why do you system. want to build problems in a fake way? I mean, it's not a problem, right? They deploy a few fixed elements. Every one more point. Um, so um, most of the current sensor networks, so they just collect the data and transmit it back yeah. to you. Uh, the, the, uh, the stations. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't process data locally. They even, you know, they, they, they prefer uh, spending some energy to transmit the data back. Mm -hmm. But they don't prefer, you know, uh, processing the data locally. <coughs> so that's, that's more challenging. And, and by the way, apart from creating a nice scientific challenge, why do you want to change that? I mean, I think it's the correct way to work. You just collect data, you send it back, and and you minimize the work you do, you do at these few moving sensors, which make them easily replaceable as well. Yeah. So at the end, why do you want to change this paradigm, apart from creating a nice problem? But uh, apart from creating a problem, is there any really <laughs> <interesting? laughs> yeah, the no, question? Let's question offline and then discuss the loop if you want. Yeah, I um, get it, but just I, I get your point that you have resources and, and, and these days they are getting cheaper and cheaper, to be honest. So it's easy to have these base stations and centralized approach. But I'm sure, I cannot think of concrete example right now, but even like I said, forest, or another example where distributed approach makes more sense. Even what he said in communication, sometimes communication is either costly more than processing or not reliable. Or not reliable. So you cannot always rely on communicating to the central node. So today it is, that's a fact. Communication is more costly than local processing in terms yeah. of energy and. So, so that's why you want to do a lot of distributed processing, right, and distributed systems. What is the advantage of a distributed system? Why do you distribute? Because you want to distribute your tasks. 
In one room, why do you deploy three sensor nodes for motions? Because you don't want one node to cover all the room. Okay, let's yeah. continue uh, next to the fish. So thank you again, and uh, <laughs> in two weeks' time, time, we have the Gisbergis seminar.